Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the legendary trainer Teddy Atlas. And today, very special episode, Teddy. We're going to talk about the 50th anniversary of Ali Frazier 1, fight of the century, March 8th, 1971. Talk to me. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's an iconic fight. It's now it's a way of uh, sort of using now partly to kind of judge how old you are, <laughs> to mark <laughs> uh, how old you are. That wow, that many years went by. Wow, I was young when Frazier and Ali were, were were doing this, and you know, it's a way of marking time. Um, great events become ways of marking time. Great events in history. It, it it was it was huge. I mean, it was like Ali and Frazier in their own way. They were pioneers in a lot of ways, but they broke barriers in many ways. Ali, of course, in many ways uh, with his social stances. But they broke barriers in the ring athletically in what they did because back in those days, fighters weren't making that kind of money. It reminds me a little bit of baseball. The owners were in charge. The owners were making all the money. The players back in the day, they'd have to play a season no matter how great they were. And then a lot of them still had to work jobs. People forget that. I mean, those days are long, long gone. But it it existed in our history, in our country, uh, in sports. And they weren't making that money. And then a guy named Flood and Catfish Hunter, they came along and they brought along free agency in baseball. And... You know, they never look back. All of a sudden, baseball players were starting to make, you know, better money. Better, 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 better. They're making more than the owners, some of them now. I'm kidding. But, I mean, you know, talk about things flipping around. Things flipped around. And there's always somebody who's there to do that. And Ali and Frazier were there to do that in boxing. They really were. They were the ones that allowed this change of you know purses nobody nobody ever dreamed that they could be sharing five million dollars i believe they each got two and a half million i believe that the the money there was five million for the for the fight i mean people were like what what now now of course you know canelo's not even gonna you know show up for breakfast if you don't give him five million you know what i mean uh (laughs) but uh really i mean $5 $5 million, I believe it was $2.5 million person for each one. It was unheard of, unheard of, unheard of. And so they broke that They broke that barrier. They are the ones that made it possible, just like the floods and the catfish hunters with baseball players made it possible for the fighters to come behind them and, you know, make the money they're making today. So it has great, great history historic you know relevance to it uh it really does uh all the things that it that it stood for and and of course Ali coming off of his retirement uh his forced retirement from the sport where his license was taken away because he refused to go into the army and to be drafted for the Vietnam War and he lost three and a half years of his the best years of his career you know and when this fight got put together it got put there kind of fast where he only had time for, he he had two tune-up fights, tune-up fights. I mean, only back in those days would you call Oscar Bonavina and Jerry Quarry two tremendous heavyweights. I mean, they, they <laughs> if they were around today, well, they'd be smaller, I get it, but they would be guys to be reckoned with. These were top fighters, top fighters. And Ali fought, the two of them in his comeback fights, his tune-ups uh, before Frazier. So he didn't have a lot of time. You know, he, he stopped Quarry on cuts. He, I believe he went 15 rounds with Bonavina. Imagine that after three and a half year layoff, coming back and 
going that many rounds in Bonavina with Bonavina, Oscar Bonavina from Argentina, like a bull, strong, good punch. He dropped Frazier when he fought Frazier. He, he lost the decision of Frazier, but it shows he had a great chin, showed you he could punch. He drops Frazier. He fights Ali. Ali, a lot of people said he couldn't punch. Well, there was a transition, a metamorphosis taking place where he couldn't use his legs so much, so he started to sit down a little bit more. And he knocked out Bonavina. A lot of Joe Frazier didn't knock him out. Joe Frazier was the puncher in this fight, but he didn't knock out Bonavina. But Ali did in the fifteenth. I believe it was the fifteenth round. It was late in the fight. He 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 knocked him out. So he showed he showed a dimension Ali that he hadn't really been known for or shown in his prior career before the layoff, before the forced retirement by the you know by the by the government, by the and the, the boxing powers when they took his license away. So it was pretty, there was a lot going on there. And it's pretty incredible, again, when you think about what Ali was up against. He's up against this perpetual punching machine, this relentless, you know, just relentless force named Joe Frazier, smoking Joe Frazier, who just kept coming forward like the ocean keeps coming into the beach and attacking that beach and hitting that beach and taking something away from that beach every time he hits it with that left hook. I mean, that was Joe Frazier. And he was at his prime and he was active. And he's fighting Ali again, who's who's removed three and a half years. He's got these two fights. I mean, it's incredible what Ali did when you think about it. And facing because his timing wasn't the same, his reflexes weren't the same. Really, what you were seeing in that fight again was a it was a changing of God. It was a it was really a an ending of seasons. The season of Ali ended, and the second season uh, of Ali was about to begin. We didn't know that because he lost the fight, but it was. The first season was where Customato used to, my mentor, the great Customato used to say to me, Ken, the only time before the forced layoff that you touched gloves with Ali was when the referee made you touch gloves before the first round. That was about it. I know Henry Cooper touched him and a couple guys, but for the most part, and, and Jones, Doug Jones early in his career, he had some tough fights, but he didn't get hit uh, much at all. It was very hard to touch this guy. And... And then he comes back, and then you could touch him. He was in front of you. You could hit him. And we saw that in that Frazier fight where he took punishment that we were not used to seeing Ali take. You know, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. That, that, that saying was invented by Ali for a reason. Not because he stood there and got hit left hooks, because he avoided left hooks, because you didn't hit him. And now he was a different guy. He had to reinvent himself. And... Another thing that was interesting about it was kind of like Duran fighting Sugar Ray Leonard. Sugar Ray Leonard was a great fighter. He was a Olympian, a gold medalist, great talent. Great. He's one of the great fighters for me in the modern era that matches up with the golden era of boxing. He, he, he matches with any era. He was that good. And when he first, you know, was making his way and becoming the champion that he was becoming, uh... People didn't completely believe in him. They believed that he was great as far as talent, that he was a lot of sizzle. They didn't know how much stake he was. They didn't know if they if he earned the right to be really admired by them, to to be trusted by them, that, that he could really behave like a fighter. They didn't know that yet. They didn't know that yet. They knew that he looked pretty damn good. He was fast. Um, he had a great smile. He had a 7-Up commercial. But they didn't know... Again, if they could trust him as a fighter. And then he fights Duran, and he fights the wrong fight. He fights inside with Duran, where Leonard was fast. He was like an alley. He could move and everything. But he fights on the outside. The second fight, the rematch, of course, he did. He fought on the outside. But the first fight, at this point in his life, he felt the need to fight inside. And he fought with him. And he fought the wrong fight, if you will, with Duran. It was a great fight, great fight in Montreal where he won the where he won his gold medal with the greatest Olympic team of all time in nineteen seventy six. I think it was the greatest Olympic team of all time. 
that he was part of uh, with the Spinks brothers and Howard Davis Jr. and, and Randolph. And, uh, and it was just a tremendous team. Five gold medals, one silver medal. And they fought everybody. They fought the Cubans. They fought the Russians. They fought everybody. But, and they beat everybody. And, and they became world champions, all of them except uh, Howard Davis Jr., who was a great boxer. Great, but matter of fact, he became the boxer of the of the Olympic tournament. He he won the he won the the Baco Award for being the greatest, uh, the top boxer of the Olympics. Uh, even though he was the only guy who didn't go on, he fought for the title a couple of times, but he didn't win the world title. Very close fight uh, that he could have maybe got the decision or one of them, but he didn't. So I think it was against Rosario, actually, if my memory serves me. But here we are where Ali's fighting Frazier. Ali's known as this fast guy, this great talent, this really unseen talent. We had never seen anyone like Ali, you know, dropping his hand, pulling back instead of slipping punches or weaving punches. He'd pull him back. He's timing. You can't hit him. You know, he's, he's moving the whole time. We'd never seen anything like this, you know? And people didn't... There were people that loved his talent, but there were people that still didn't believe in him. And then, of course, there was the, the half of the country that hated him for not going into the war. So you had all this going on. I mean, you had so much going on, Ken. And like I said, when, when Lennon fights against the great Duran, and all people knew was he was fast, he was talented, but they didn't know more about him. If he was really a fighter, if he was someone they could embrace in that way. He goes and fights the wrong fight with Duran. He fights inside. It's a great fight. He loses. And he gets more out of that as far as embracement of the fans than he did with all his wins. He gets more respect, more love, if you will, he becomes one of theirs. They, 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 they say, okay, we trust him now. They embrace him. They take him in. The fans say, yeah, he's a fighter. It didn't matter that he lost. It mattered how he behaved. That's what mattered. How he acted, how he behaved. And the same thing happened with Ali. He loses the fight. It was a close fight, a lot closer than people thought, And I think. And he gets dropped in the 15th round with that his iconic, historic left hook that drops him and cements the decision for Frazier, but he gets up and his jaw is swollen, he gets up and he finishes the, the fight with this punching machine, this unrelenting force of Joe Frazier. And people forgave him for whatever it is they thought they needed to forgive him for, for not going in the army, whatever. You know, we understood more. We grew a lot as a country, as people. We understood what was behind it more we, than we did at that time. Um, but people could accept him now in two ways. That he was more than just a fast guy with sizzle. There was steak. That he was gutsy. That he was a fighter. And that, it, that he behaved like a fighter. Yeah, I know it sounds crazy. You got to get hit to, to be acknowledged, to be brought into that camp by the Sometimes. Sometimes because people get hit in life and they want to see if you could get hit in life or if you're just more talented than they are and God gave you more talent than them and, and therefore it's not fair that, that, that you were given so much talent they weren't given so much talent and they have to suffer and they have to go through the pains and the bruises and the aches and, and the hurts and the, everything else and you don't have to go through it. They, they, and then all of a sudden they see you go through it. They say, wow, wow. He's one of us. Yeah, I can I can like him. I can accept him. Yeah. And that that happened just kind of like the Leonard Durant thing, where now they saw him in a war, they saw him get hit. They didn't see him slipping and sliding and and, and becoming a ghost in the ring and the other guy falling trying to hit him. Now all of a sudden they saw him vulnerable. They saw him human. They saw him on the floor and they saw him get up. And they embraced him. They said, you earned our respect. And like I said, even the ones on the other side that hated him for not going to the war, they said, you know, a coward and all this crap and all that stuff they were saying. But now they said, wow, the guy, he behaved like a fighter, like a man. And so there was so much to it. And Joe Frazier, you know, 
it meant so much to him because, I mean, Ali was going into this fight with all the things I just described, going into the fight. It was so much more than just an athletic venture, an athletic contest, so much more. I mean, some people painted Frazier like he was the white guy and Ali like he was the black guy because of the social distance differences in the country and because of the Vietnam situation and all of the things that were going on in this country while we were still growing as people. It was pretty amazing. It was pretty freaking amazing that this was going on. And Frazier was hurt by it. Frazier was like, hey, look at my skin. I'm darker than him. I'm not black. I'm darker than him. I had a tougher life than him. I was I was living as a sharecropper. I was I was out in the fields pulling up crops, you know, digging holes. I mean, you know, he was, he was hurt. He was hurt. And um, it, meant, it meant a lot more than the two and a half million dollars. The two and a half million, unheard of, unheard of. But it meant a lot more than that to both men, to both men, for reasons that are obvious when I talk about it. And so Frazier goes in there, and I'm telling you, Ali became a puncher. Again, I had to say that about Oscar Bonavino so people can really understand the true backdrop of this. Really, I don't think it gets explained properly that Ali wasn't just that fast butterfly no more, stinging like a bee. No, he was putting, he was putting hurts on people. He, 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 he was stinging like a whole freaking beehive. <laughs> Not a bee. Not a bee. He was stinging like a like like a bull stings you when he hits you with his horns. That that's a lot more than a freaking sting, you know. And he's sitting down now on his punches, and he's hitting Frazier shots coming in left to right. Da 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 da. Frazier just keeps coming, bobbing we wop 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 with the left hook to the body. That I mean, Ali was peeing blood for for weeks. So. Frazier, people forget, he spent maybe a week in the hospital. I don't know exactly how long, but he spent time in the hospital. He was the winner. He was all bumped up, all lumped up. He went. He was in the hospital. He was, he was beaten up. I know he was the winner, but my God, that man, he took a beating. He won it legitimately. Don't get me wrong. I'm not steering you that way. I'm just saying there was so much more to this than maybe people... People remember maybe. They don't remember all that. Then not everyone was there to, to see it or to watch it again uh, on film. But Ali, like I said, he was a different Ali. He wasn't that guy moving around. He was that guy hitting you with, with shots now. And he hit this Joe Frazier with shots and he just kept coming. And then, like I said, he exploded that iconic left hook in the 15th round. Uh, where you could actually see Ali's eyes go back of his head as he gets hit, <laughs> he gets hit, he drops, he gets up. Wow, 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 wow. Um, it was uh, it was amazing. It was like reading a book, chapter after chapter. It was, it was it was amazing. It was an amazing fight. It stands the test of time. We're still talking about it. But it was amazing because of its place in history because of what it stood for, what it meant, because of all the things that I hopefully just did a decent job of bringing into it a lot more than just lefts and rights, a lot more. And, and it was really speaks to what this sport is supposed to be. Two men finding out about themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two men finding out about themselves, going to places that they hadn't been to before. They hadn't been to, there, there was... There was no map to tell you how to get there. <laughs> there was no freaking map, Ken, to tell you how to get there. There was no lantern to light the way to get there. You had to just be willing to go. And these two great men were willing to go. Yeah, awesome event. Um, do you remember the, um, the thriller in Manila when, um, was it Eddie Futch stopped the fight at the, at the end of maybe the 14th? 14th, yes, it was. it was. It could have been stopped even earlier, but yeah, Eddie Futch. Uh, I was just thinking about that when you were saying about um, that they were going where they needed to go and what a beating he took, and that he took such a beating in the last fight, in the third fight, that they eventually, the corner had to stop it. But Joe Frazier probably would have just kept going. Oh, yeah, yeah, he wouldn't have stopped it. I mean, that's where you need a corner man that has humanity, that has care, that loves you, that 
as professional and caring and a human being because when you got a fighter like that, they have to be protected from themselves because they're going to just behave to the last drip of blood and the last beat of heart and the last breath in their chest. They're just going to keep going because they're going to they're going to honor the code. They're going to honor the code. Like I talk about these great UFC fighters, same thing. They're going to honor the code. The code of being a samurai. The code of being a warrior. The, the code of never relenting. The code of never saying, I'm going to be conquered. No. 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 And um, it's not in their vocabulary. It's not in their existence. It's not in their beliefs. Um, so they have to be looked out for. And you need a corner man to look out for him. And Eddie Fudge, God bless him, was was the guy that, that did that and, and stopped that. And that was a brutal fight. That was a fight that was so brutal for a lot of reasons. One of them was a lot of their talent was gone. A lot of their reflexes, a lot of, the, a lot of their physical skills were gone. All that was left was their character, power, physical power that they... You know, you still have that, that you're hitting. So, but their character and by their skills being diminished, they were easier to hit now. So, so they were, oh my goodness, when you think about it, they were, they were kind of like, they were like, in some ways, this is very graphic, but like shooting fish in a barrel. Like the fish have nowhere to go. You, 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 of course you're going to catch them. It's not like shooting them in a lake where they can be fish. They're in a barrel. They can't be fish no more. They can't swim away. Same thing with these great fighters. They, they couldn't be those guys moving their head, bobbing and weaving as much, being as fast, Ali, being able to, uh, you know, the, those skills was, was so eroded, so much of them taken away that now they were just right in front of you to get hit. And all that persevered was their character. Their ability to absorb, their willingness to be hurt, to to endure, <coughs> to go on, to try to keep finding a way, to not relent, to not be conquered. And that's all that was left. And oh my goodness, <coughs> it made for a historic fight and a great fight, you know, to for people, but a damaging fight, a fight where... Much of them was left in the ring that night. Much of them was left in Manila. In Manila. You know? And um, I know that you, you go to these great men's graves and you, you know where to go, where, where they're buried. You go to the graves and you put flowers if, you, if you're prone to do that, if that's what you want to do. And you put flowers or you just say a prayer over their headstone. But if you're ever in Manila and you, and you know where to find where the ring was set up that night and you really love these men that much and you admire what they did that much, um, you're a fan of theirs that much, well, you might go there to that area and drop a flower there. Yeah. Well, Teddy, thanks for doing this. I know the fans are going to enjoy this one. Uh, appreciate your time. Uh, with that, guys, thanks for being with us. Th thanks for getting those pictures up too, Ken. I mean, look. My pleasure. Really, it's 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 tremendous to have them there to remind us as we're talking about these two great warriors. Yeah.